Good morning, friends. The last time we read The Power of Un, you got to hear the spitball incident and how Gib spit a spitball at his teacher. And at the very same time, Rainey spit a spitball at Gib. And instead of taking the blame, well, the teacher turned around and saw Rainey holding the straw. Gib was smart enough to hide his. And of course, blamed Rainey for the spitball that hit her, the teacher. And instead of standing up and taking the blame, Gib sat there and played dumb. And I asked you whether you would take the blame. Would you do the right thing in this case? What your conscience is probably telling you is the right thing. Or would you sit there like Gib did and not speak up? And most of you said that you would do the right thing. You would stand up and take the blame. But there were a handful of you that fairly said that you wouldn't because Rainey had been so awful to you earlier in the day, you know, thinking if you were Gib. And that's completely fair. Um, I just thought it was interesting. So we're picking up from there today. I'm on page 10 and we'll see what happens next. Remember he said that this whole story started because of the spitball incident. So you'll see how that plays a key role in what happens next. Have you ever watched a spider walk across a web on a misty morning? It might only step on one tiny strand of silk, but the whole web moves. Then far on the other side, a dewdrop might fall and jiggle other stands of, strands of silk, or maybe even break one. The whole shape of the web can change because of that one eensy step. That spitball was a spider step. It was just one little thing, but it made other things happen one after another till the whole shape of my life was different and not in a good way either. Ash had a soccer game after school that day, so our plan was to meet at his house after dinner, then walk over to the carnival. We had a lot of ideas about what to do once we got there. Play the games, get lost in the house of mirrors, eat way too much junk food. We'd heard that the fortune teller, Madam Isis, was spookily great. And we wanted to ride the rides, of course. There was a new one we'd never been on called the Devil's Elevator, and it was supposed to be pretty good. Jeffrey Hargrove said it made his big sister barf, which was an outstanding recommendation. After school, I went home, dumped my books, and said hi to my dad, who usually comes home around three from work at his rare bookstore. Then I did a bunch of other stuff just to kill time till dinner. I played doggy with Roxy, which I hardly ever do. Remember, Roxy's his little sister. Who in his right mind wants to pretend his kid sister is a dog? It's bad enough if you have to take a real dog for a walk, feed it, and brush it. Doing those things to a dog-obsessed six-year-old is totally weird. But I was in a good mood, so I said yes when she asked me. After that, I shot some hoops above the garage door. When I came back inside, my dad was on the phone, looking serious. Oh, don't worry, he said. These things happen. Gib can take care of Roxy. Hope you feel better soon. He hung up and I could see from his face that he was about to tell me something he knew I'd hate. That was Rainy Frogner, he said. At first I wondered what Rainy was doing on the phone with my father. Would she seriously complain to my parents about the spitball thing? Then I remembered she was babysitting Roxy that night because mom and dad were going out and so was I. My stomach did a somersault and ended up somewhere around my vocal cords. She can't babysit, I croaked. Dad nodded. She says she's not feeling well. Sorry, kiddo, you're going to have to watch, Ro Ra uh, you're going to have to watch Roxy tonight. Not feeling well? She was fine at school today. I don't get it. But even as the words were leaving my mouth, I got it all right. Rainy wasn't sick. She was mad and she was getting even with me. Some kind of stomach bug, said Dad. But I'm going to the carnival tonight, Dad. Ash and I have been planning this for weeks. Well, you can take Roxy with you. I know she'd love to go. Take Roxy? A pain was growing somewhere behind my eyes. A picture formed in my brain of me going on the baby rides, holding Roxy's hand, which would be stuck to mine with gooey cotton candy, and taking her to the porta potties. Dad, if I do that, I won't have any fun at all. Can't you guys just, I don't know, 
skip the dance or something tonight? He and mom were going to my aunt and uncle's, going with my aunt and uncle to a square dance. One of those dumb things where everyone dresses up in Western clothes and stomps and whoops for hours while a country band plays songs with names like Flop-Eared Mule and Shindig in the Barn. I couldn't imagine why anybody would want to go to such a thing. Look, we don't want to cancel our plans any more than you want to cancel yours, said dad. Of course you'll still have fun. You'll just have Roxy along while you're at it. But dad, now, by now my voice was barely a squeak. No buts. I knew by the way he said this, that further argument would just make things worse. Besides, I was afraid I might start crying. The room was beginning to feel incredibly small and hot. I opened the front door. I'm going for a walk. Make sure you're back in time for dinner, said dad. His voice trailed after me as I closed the door. Sorry things worked out this way. Sorry, sure, I thought. There was an empty Coke can on the sidewalk in front of our house and I kicked it as hard as I could. Then I found a rock and I kicked that too. Every time I took a step all the way to the woods at the end of the block. I wished I was an only child, that Roxy had been kidnapped from the hospital at birth or had been bitten by a tropical mosquito and died of malaria before the age of two. I wished Rainy Frogner knew the meaning of the word mercy. Most of all, I wish I'd never heard of spitballs. There's a path through the woods and I started to run along it, still kicking everything I came across. Dry leaves flew up in fountains, twigs sailed through the air. The last thing I kicked was a tree trunk and it hurt so much I had to sit on the ground holding my foot and saying every swear word I knew. I was pretty distracted so it came as a shock when I looked up and saw, through a blur of angry tears, someone standing just a few feet away from me watching me. I probably would have yelled if I could have, but I was so startled my throat closed and I jumped up, ready to run, before I had that time to think about it. There was such a roar of rushing blood in my ears that I could hardly hear anything else, and the world seemed eerily quiet. Whoever it was stood in the deep shadow of a tree. The sun was about to set, and the woods felt too dark for comfort. The figure wore a long, shapeless garment, maybe a trench coat, maybe some kind of robe. When he opened his mouth, he spoke in a deep, raspy voice. Don't be afraid. I won't hurt you, he said. He might as well have said he was an axe murderer. He took a step forward and there was just one word in my mind flashing like a neon sign, run. Unfortunately, the heel of my high top caught on a root as I tried to back up. I landed hard on my rear. The old man loomed over me. He smelled strange, like hot metal or lightning. I thought I saw smoke rising from his rumpled clothes and a weird halo of silvery hair that stood out from his head. He had an object I couldn't identify in his raised hand. I've got something for you, he said, and he opened his mouth in a crazy grin. All right. I'm going to end there. If you think back to this chapter, it was called The Stranger in the Woods, and now you know why. I have a couple questions for you today in Seesaw after listening, and hope that you're enjoying the book. See you soon.